It's been quite an evening, hasn't it? The noise level is less at 7 o'clock than it was at 6. But you know what? Sitting here on the front pew, uh, scripture came to my mind in regards to your activities tonight. Jesus said there's rejoicing in heaven among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he's not willing that any should perish, that, but that all should come to repentance. If one child or one parent, one visitor, eventually meets the Lord through your influence in this ministry, they're going to throw a party in heaven. There's rejoicing in heaven among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I'm glad for your open-mindedness and your cooperativeness. I saw substantial team spirit. And uh, y'all pulled the wagon and you got somewhere and you had some successful achievement. I want to say thank you for the privilege of being with you again. This is my fourth revival here. First time was in the year 2000. And uh, I've seen your progress and you've advanced and uh, your influence in the community has multiplied. And, and God's smiling right now when he looks down at Harris Chapel. Whisper prayer for me as the Lord may bring me to your mind. I have a plane tomorrow about 8 o'clock from Indianapolis down to Denver, Denver out to San Diego. In my 43 years of doing this, I've had to take a lot of flights. I remember one flight. We landed <clears throat> rather roughly. I wouldn't be exaggerating if I told you the pilot dribbled the plane <laughs> down the runway. And there was a little atmosphere of shock and panic and fear and a little bit of noise. He finally got the thing settled down and scooted up to the runway, and, uh, from the runway up to the gate. And preceding me off the plane uh, to greet the pilot and the flight attendants at the door, there was a senior adult lady, and she stopped. She was very well-dressed, polished, elegant attire. And she looked up at the pilot and said, young man, may I ask you a question? And he said, yes, ma'am. She said, did we crash or were we shot down? <laughs> so I'll be flying again tomorrow, so I wouldn't mind if you said a prayer for me. Next Sunday, Easter, I'll be preaching downtown LA at Los Angeles First Church of the Nazarene. So Vicki and I have to get up early and drive about 90 miles into L.A. and hope the traffic's kind and have a service there. They're going to have a combined service between the English and the Filipino congregations. And they're going to have it outside in the courtyard. So it'll be a kind of a different deal. I'm going to baptize on Easter Sunday morning, L.A. first. So whisper prayer for me. And on it goes. So we're going to look at God's word again tonight. And I'd like you to bow your heads and invite the Lord to speak to your heart. There's something he'd like to say to every one of us, and we need to be deliberately receptive and specifically focused. It's mighty easy to allow our attention to be distracted and take off in tangent directions because there's always issues that are on our minds, and uh, we're going to have to do the best we can to say, Lord, speak to my heart tonight and, and help me to hear your word and understand and and pursue the future in hope and faith and trust. Thank you, Lord, for the way your Holy Spirit has blessed us. This has been a good week, and we've sensed your presence with us in every service. Thank you for Pastor Jim and Janie and their influence all these years here in this community and the ministry this church has had in so many lives. Thank you for the big event we had earlier this evening, and I pray, Lord, as we head towards Resurrection Sunday, that you'll be honored and glorified. And whatever you want to say to us tonight from the scripture, I pray that you'll give us a special, special ability to focus and be attentive and responsive in Jesus' name. Amen. I have three questions for you to start with. Do you believe in God? That's an unnecessary and obvious question. There's a purpose for it. And you would all say, yes, Norman, of course. Hello, what's your point? Get on with it. 
Okay, you believe in God. Number two, do you have faith in God? And I could probably work on that a while and get some obligatory nods. So we agree that we believe in God and we agree that we have faith in God. There's a difference. The third question is, do you trust in God? It's one thing to say we believe in Him, another thing to say we tr uh, have faith in Him, but yet it's something beyond that to say we trust Him. Why do I give focus to that issue? Because these are days of worry and anxiety and fear for a lot of people. And not all those folks with such a malady are outside of these walls. Even the people of God are tempted to worry and be fearful and have anxiety and be depressed. Well, we're going to look at some scripture this evening that uh, will poignantly remind us that we can trust him. Mark's gospel at chapter 8 and verse 13. 8th chapter Mark, 13th verse. And leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And the disciples had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. It wasn't a big loaf of bread. It was a biscuit, a dinner roll, okay? And he was given orders to them saying, Watch out, beware of the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet comprehend or understand? Do you still have your heart hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? They said to him, 12. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, Seven. And he was saying to them, Do you not yet understand? In the Gospel of Mark, there are two different accounts of Jesus feeding the multitude. The first one is in Mark 6 at verse 34. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd, and feeling compassion for them, he began to teach them like sheep without a shepherd. And then it was time to feed the crowd, and you know the story that's more commonly told and preached. The disciples found a schoolboy with a sack lunch. That miracle from Mark 6 is the only miracle story in all four Gospels. But on a different time, different occasion, Jesus fed another crowd. And after that, Jesus got in the boat with the guys and they headed across the lake. And they started discussing with each other, oh man, we forgot the food. Jesus made an application, a timely illustration, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, speaking of the evil inherent in those. 
And he was aware that the guys were fussing. Here in NASB it says, begin to discuss. Research it, you know what it means? Argue. I admit up front this is a bit of conjecture or speculation or personal interpretation, but it's not far from what was going on in the boat. You're not going to convince me, they said, oh, we forgot the bread. Well, what a wonderful opportunity to exercise our trust in the Lord. Whoever was bread chairman today will give you a pass and extend grace to you, dear brother. Do you believe that? I don't. They were arguing with each other. I don't know if they had bread duty assigned to one specific guy. Johnny, where's the bread? Not my day. Today's Tuesday. Tuesday's Tim's day. Or Tom's day. They were fussing with each other. And there is a temptation for us to fuss whenever we bump into a need, an unanticipated obstacle. But you know what? All the criticism and all the blame, all the accusation, all the fussing didn't put one more biscuit in the boat. A far better option is to affirm our trust in the Lord. We may have been forgetful, we may have been negligent, we may have messed up, but Jesus is still in the boat. Would you like some good news this Wednesday night? Jesus is still in the boat. And he's not nervous. And Jesus reminded them of past victories. Uh, He said, remember when we fed the 5,000? How many baskets full did you pick up? And then he said, more recently when we fed the 4,000, how many baskets full did you pick up? When we're tempted to be worried and fearful and anxiety encroaches on us, it's helpful for us to review previous victories. It reminds me of uh, God speaking to Moses. He said, go down there and tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. Well, I'll save you all that debate and all those plagues. But eventually the whole crowd left town. And they bumped into an unanticipated obstacle called the Red Sea. And his optimism committee uh, came to Moses and said, oh, wonderful strategy, we're going to be slaughtered out here in the desert. You got a committee like that in the church? Always looking on the dark side. Moses prayed, God heard, and parted the Red Sea And the Bible says they walked across on dry ground. But if you research that, you want to know what it really means? It means they walked across on dry ground. That's what it means. (laughs) This is God's word. It says what it means, and it means what it says. Later, on the other side of the Red Sea, folks got hungry, and here came that complaint committee. said, oh, is this the strategy? We're kind of putting it together. We're going to starve to death out of here. Is that the idea? And Moses said, hang on. And he prays, and God hears, and he puts manna on the ground. Sweet bread from heaven's bakery, fresh every morning. You know what the Hebrew translation is for manna? Dunkin' Donuts. (laughs) Or Krispy Kremes. I don't know. I just made that up, you can tell. Well, later the folks got thirsty. They came to him with their complaint. Oh, we're supposed to die of thirst out here. And by now, Moses is well-conditioned. There's no doubt as Pastor Jim. You better pray. And God heard, and he got water out of the rock. Do you know what the lesson is in that story? God has multiple options by which he can meet your need. During Jesus' life and ministry, those disciples had multiple opportunities to get it and grasp what's going on here. Jesus was very God, but very man, and his humanity became fatigued. The Bible says he took a nap on the, in the back of the boat. 
an unpredicted squall hit the lake, and Jesus' optimism committee woke him up and said, don't you care that we're about to go under? You ever heard that in a board meeting? Jesus yawned and stretched. I imagine him scratch his hair in his beard and shake his head and mumble, when are you guys ever going to figure out who I am? You got the rest of the story memorized, don't you? He walked out of the bow of the ship, held it out his hand. You got that memorized in King James, don't you? What did it say? Peace be still. I read a modern paraphrase. You know what it said? Hush, knock it off. <laughs> and there was a great calm. And the guys looked at each other. Their mouth dropped open. Their eyebrows arched. Their eyes bugged out. They smacked themselves unanimously and in unison in the forehead, and said, Whoa, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus got word, Get over here to Bethany as quick as you can. Your buddy Lazarus is sick. Read that story in the Gospel of John. The Bible says he stayed two days longer on purpose where he was. Go figure that out. What's the lesson? There's a strategy God has. It is apparent delay in your answer to prayer. His delays are not necessarily his denials. We say we believe in him. We say we have faith in him, but do we trust him? Jesus showed up in Bethany a couple days later. Separately, two sisters came to him with the same complaint. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus took the opportunity for a timely lesson on faith and the resurrection. And then they went to the tomb. And after he overcame the objection of the older sister odor expert, they moved the stone. And the Bible says in the Gospel of John with a loud voice, Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And since he spoke, it had to happen. Who was that? Jesus Christ, God's son, co-creator with the Father in eternity. John chapter 1 describes them, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And Jesus Christ, co-creator with the Father in eternity, who spoke the world into existence, now spoke new life into Lazarus. And Lazarus, all tightly wrapped in burial garb, stands up and wiggles his way to the mouth of that tomb, and through his facial bandages, I imagine him pop one eye open after the other. And through his bandages, he said, did you call me? <laughs> Who was there? Those disciples were there. They saw the whole thing. Jesus and the disciples were downtown Jericho. And heading down Main Street one afternoon, and a persistent blind guy named Bartimaeus yelled out aggressively from the side of the road, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The religious bunch tried to hush him up. Don't make a scene. Hush, be quiet. He called out all the more aggressively, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus called time out for the Main Street parade downtown Jericho, and he pivoted towards the curb and walked over and looked him in the face. He said, what would you like me to do for you? Can you imagine the Jesus who Proverbs describes as a friend who sticks closer than a brother coming to you tonight and said, what would you like me to do for you? Bartimaeus provides us a premium example. He was in touch with the reality of his chronic need. He wasn't living in denial. He didn't ask for a white cane or a CNI dog or a scholarship to the Braille Institute. He said, I want to receive my sight. Can we openly and honestly and transparently come to the Lord before we go and say, Lord, this is my need? No snow job, no rationalizations, no excuses, no delays, no denials. This is the real deal. I need your help with this. Jesus concluded there, downtown Jericho, man, that sounded like a mighty good idea to me, and he healed him right there downtown Main Street in Jericho. Those disciples were there. These are the same guys that are fussing about only having one biscuit in the boat. <laughs> they had some unanticipated obstacles. They had an obvious need. 
Jesus helped them review previous victories. And tonight would be a healthy time for every one of us to review previous victories. Remember when you looked like you were going under for keeps? That it was history. It was all over and there's no way in the world you're going to make it. It could have been physical or financial. It could have been marital. It could have been family. It could have been job. I don't have a clue. But we've all been there when we were going under. Reminds me when Peter tried to walk on the water, seeing the wind and waves becoming afraid, beginning to sink. What did he do? He cried out, Lord, save me. And my favorite word in that story is immediately. Jesus didn't say, sink you, fool. A lot of preachers are beat up on Peter for sinking. I got to tell you, he was 99% successful. There's a boat. There's Jesus. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus, seeing the wind and the waves, becoming afraid, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. What's that tell you? He was within arm's reach. Pretty good for his first try. You've been going under? You've been in an emergency situation? I hesitate to tell you, but I've been there recently. October 26th, I was admitted to the hospital with COVID and double pneumonia. And I was in the hospital three days out of six. But on the third day, they finally told me that I was not terminal. But those first three days, I wasn't at the back door, but I could see over the fence. And there was one night before I fell asleep in that hospital bed, I said, Lord, please spare my life. Because I didn't know if I'd wake up the next morning. I was on full-time oxygen for 47 days. Ten weeks. And finally on January 2nd, I preached my first time since late October. And I'm still trying to rev up and get with it. Thanks for your patience. I know what it means to be in an emergency. But you know what? Jesus is still in the boat. You might be thinking, well, I I know somebody who was sick and I prayed and they died. The best prayer you'll ever pray is not my will but thine be done. And there's not some superficial rationalization that going to heaven is the ultimate healing because they'll never be sick again. We have to trust him and his sovereignty with the outcome of our needs. And Jesus kindly confronted them. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? We say we believe in God. We say we have faith in God. We even say we trust in God. And I say let's prove it with whatever issue you're facing tonight. You may only have one biscuit, but Jesus is still in the boat. In his Sermon on the Mount, two times, In the sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus says, your father knows. Matthew 6, verse 8, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Same chapter, chapter 6, Matthew, only verse 32 this time. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly father knows knows that you need all these things. Dear sweet, precious friend, on this unique Wednesday night at Harris Chapel, I got to tell you, your heavenly Father knows. 
and we say we believe in him, we say we trust him, have faith in him, we say we trust him, well, let's exhibit it and surrender to him whatever the issue is. In Matthew 11, verse 30, Jesus said, Come to me, you who are weary and labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. rest. Could you all stand some rest from the issues that you're concerned about? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And in the context of that statement, he says he rarely describes his interior self-image. He described himself, King James, meek and lowly, NIV, gentle and humble. As I studied that, I wondered, now, isn't that curious? When Jesus comes to describe who he thinks he is and what he's all about, he disclose his interior self-image, he uses two words, I am gentle and humble. I notice he didn't say I'm harsh and critical. He didn't say I'm negative and pessimistic. He didn't say I'm on your case and in your face. He says I'm gentle and humble. And the one who's gentle and humble is among us tonight. And regardless of what your need is, Jesus is still in the boat. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. I, what? Surrender. Surrender. How much? Oh. Oh, Did you notice they didn't title that song, I Negotiate a Compromise? What's it say? I surrender all. Is there something in this concluding service, this Holy Week revival, that you need to surrender to Him? We're as human as those disciples were, and sometimes we can fuss about the need that's prevalent. Let's take time to review previous victories and reaffirm our trust and confidence in Him. And... Surrender the issue to him for his time, his will, his solution, his answer. Please stand. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. And he's the one who's gentle and humble. And he's here tonight, and he loves you more than you've ever realized. So with some quiet invitation music, I'd like to offer you one more time a cordial and respectful opportunity to respond to the whisper of the Holy Spirit and come forward and kneel at the altar or sit on the front pew. Jesus is still in the boat, and you're going to make it. You need to pray. What issues remain on God's agenda for you during this revival series? You're welcome to come right now. No better time than now. No better place than here. God's here and your heart is tender. You're aware of a need and things aren't exactly as they need to be. You might be fussing and worried, doubtful, full of fear. Anxiety has been a daily companion. It can be different tonight. You can review previous victories when you were going under and Jesus showed up. You can trust the timing and the method to him and his sovereign will and his plan. Those who want to pray, come join us right now. Father, thank you for Revival Week here at Harris Chapel. 
We appreciate each time we've gathered together and your Holy Spirit has tutored us from the scriptures. As we've left the church, we've mused in our private moments throughout the following days on his application of your word to our particular situations. I pray, Lord, that tonight we'll review past victories and rejoice over your intervention in our previous emergencies. And we come to you now with the current issues on our hearts and minds and surrender them to you and reaffirm our confidence and our hope, our trust in you and your sovereign will and know that you do all things well. I pray for these kneeling here at the altar, those there at the pews. You know the issues that have flashed up on our minds and linger in our imaginations. Help us to let go, turn loose, surrender, and trust you in a more complete, thorough, deep way than ever before. Thank you for revival time. Hear the prayers of these dear friends as they offer their petitions to you. And please accept our sincere, heartfelt praise.